life resurfaced in many of his sculptural works. Crucially, it was also this act of kindness that directly informed his sense that art had the power to heal. And the Ziel sind wie viele Bäume? Das Ziel ist die ganze Welt mit Bäumen voll zu pflanzen. Welchen Anteil wollen Sie da selbst übernehmen? So viel wie möglich. So viel in meiner Lebenszeit pflanzen kann. I think Joseph Boyce uh, is more like a, a heroic poet. You can, you can see this kind of sincere ideology. He trying to make the world as a, uh, become a better world. By the late 1970s, Boyce had become a global figure. The remainder of his career was spent as an art nomad, exhibiting, performing, and staging happenings across the world such as the three days he spent in New York, locked inside a gallery with a wild coyote. A year before his death in 1986, Joseph Boyce came to London to mount his final political statement, Plight. The installation saw the entire Anthony Duffet gallery plastered floor to ceiling in reams of felt, with a grand piano, blackboard, and thermometer as its centerpiece. When you were in the room, you heard your heart beating. You heard things in your body that you'd never experienced before. You felt as though you were in another world. As Boyce explained to the BBC, the work symbolized his belief in the transformative power of art against the negative forces of capitalism. Art is not there to, to be understood. Art is the thing where you have to identify you with because art contains the elements of the creativity which also exists in you, which is presently completely alienated by, uh, by uh, yeah, let's say, by government over the people by powers which are infiltrated by media, by interests which are coming from the markets, from the capital, from the interest to make profit and to gain, to, to, to try to gain power. The best things in life are free. You can give them to the bad and bees. Boyce was fighting a rearguard action against the advance of capitalism. The stock market boom of the 1980s saw money pour into the art world as traders looked to modern art as a safe investment for their newfound wealth. Seven million pounds. <laughs> cometh the hour, cometh the man. I'm a very clever person. I think I could be making even more money in another field, in another area. I'm limited to the income that I can have as an artist. I can make maybe several million a year if I'm extremely successful, but I could never come into the 100 million a year range, the half a billion a year range. For the past 30 years, Jeff Koons has cultivated a reputation for pushing taste to the limit. He specializes in turning everyday objects into high art by hiring skilled craftsmen to turn his ideas into expensive sculptures. To cover the heavy costs of creating his early work, Koons spent six years as a commodities trader on Wall Street. At the same time, by his own admission, he began to manipulate the art market in his favor. A piece like my Aqualung that uh, may have cost $20,000 to make, I would sell for $4,000 and then end up giving the gallery a 50% cut on that, walking away with $2,000, taking a $17,000, $18,000 loss on a piece. But I did that only because I wanted them to go to collections, and if I was going to penetrate, it was time to penetrate them. When Jeff Koons arrived, 
everybody said the same thing. He's a merchant banker, he's decided to become an artist, so he's brought all the know-how of the Wall Street operator to art. And so, right from the beginning, from, from, from the very first mention of Jeff Koons, there was suspicion. Certainly, art critic Robert Hughes needed some convincing when he met Koons for the BBC in 1996. Hi, Jeff. A kitten in a giant sock. Tell me about it. It's a piece that's working in kind of a very classical tradition of uh, a crucifixion and uh, also deal with a spiritual theme. Well, I don't see much spirituality there yet. I see a very large and playful pussycat in a sock, but how are you going to inject spirituality into this image? I'm going to give the, the cat a little more Bambi-like eyelashes. Ah, very spiritual Bambi, yeah. I try to make works, <clears throat> pardon me, that are very generous. I try to be as generous as I can be with myself. Uh, what do you mean and by generous? I mean, in what, you know, how is this more generous, say, than uh, uh, some other kind of sculpture? What's, what's generous about it? Well, I think that it's communicating uh, love, it's communicating uh, happiness. Uh, and it doesn't alienate anyone. I think that a young child could come in here, a five-year-old child, uh, could look and find some pleasure and some enjoyment, and I hope that it's something positive for humankind. Kuhn's most memorable work was also his first financial breakthrough, the Banality series that began in 1988. The series saw the kind of kitsch objects found in gift shops spun into oversized sculptures that divided critics. I was very uh, pleased with uh, the response to the work. I was glad that the work uh, 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 did generate a response, that it did not go unnoticed. The images, these images of banality and dislocated imagery, is what the bourgeois responds to. This is what the ads uh, that they respond to in Vogue magazine are based on. But at the same time, they also feel the guilt and shame of this. As Kuhn's self-produced adverts showed, he was a new type of artist, unashamed about his desire to make money from art. By the end of the 1980s, the boom years were well and truly over. Across the Atlantic, Thatcher's Britain seemed a divided land. The shift of money and power to the masters of global finance left many workers feeling marginalised or excluded. The British art world was no different, dominated by a handful of galleries that ignored the work of younger artists. It was time to rediscover the radicalism of previous generations. We all think that, that Damien Hirst was always a gigantic figure. Well, no, he wasn't in the beginning. He was a nobody. And yet this nobody took on the art world in a most explicit way. In 1988, Damien Hirst was just another ambitious art student when he organised Freeze, a showcase of talent from Goldsmiths College and the BBC were intrigued enough to send The Late Show's Matthew Collings to meet a 23-year-old Damien Hirst. So what does everyone at the school think? Well, there's a bit of mixed feelings, I think. It's kind of separated the school into two halves. A lot of people are kind of anti-freeze, mm -hmm. and a lot of people are for it. Who are the ones who are anti-freeze? Why are they that? I don't know. I think it's just, you know, any kind of success, people don't really like it, do they? The art world was Thatcherite. The art world was the world that said, these are the rules, and if you don't do it this way, you know, you're going to have your bottom spanked. And he comes along and he does it differently. It was, a, it was a rebellion. It was a revolt. Bypassing the traditional gallery system, Damien Hirst and the other 15 artists featured at Freeze would be propelled into the art world spotlight to become known as the YBAs, or the Young British Artists. 
Not many people really got the fact that Damien was going to be the, the biggest and most ambitious and the most creative artist of them all. Why did they shoot it? To kill it. <laughs> to kill it. <laughs> she was, uh, she had a calf and she never got over carving. Oh, uh, right. In the early 1990s, Hearst began a series of now iconic works that thrilled some and appalled others, featuring dead animals in various states of decomposition. Should we go get a burger? The works were an instant sensation. One of the most celebrated, Mother and Child Divided, made its debut at the prestigious Venice Biennale. What is art for me? I think that's quite a difficult question. I mean, I think people who say that what I do isn't art, you know, it's very easy, I think, to say what something, what isn't. But it's very difficult to actually do something. And people who don't even like art go kind of, ooh, you know, it's just an interesting object. I hope it makes the world richer, you know, people like to see things like that. I don't expect them to walk in and go, ooh, life and death, or, oh my god, it's about the texture of ennui and the quality of life and the horrific society, you know, if they just go, ooh, wow, that's fantastic, you know, I'm really pleased. Uh, I think you should work on many levels like that. Part of a wider shift that saw yesterday's rebels become today's mainstream, Hearst, the former Enfant Terrible, has become the most famous and wealthiest artist in the world. Here in Britain, his many works on the theme of life and death have transformed him into a household name. And they marked a turning point for the way we as a nation engage with contemporary art. Artists used to be minor figures working away in their attics, unnoticed. And then suddenly that changed. I now declare the Tate Modern open. Britain, a nation of art haters, turned into a nation of art lovers. The big change in my lifetime about contemporary art in this country is that, you know, a lot more people are interested in it. Most people now, if you said Damon has Sharp to them, they'd probably know what you're talking about. Thank God, you know, that I'm in a period when art is, has a bigger audience. Art moved from the back pages of the newspapers to the front page. And that has unquestionably been the big story of, of art in my lifetime. Comedy headed your way here on BBC4 next. Double parks and recreation coming up. And Leslie's smarting over the injustice of it all. Stay with us.